Okay, so today we are going to do the interlude between the fifth trumpet and the sixth trumpet. The interlude is the um, is Revelation uh, 11, 10, uh, and 10, right? But today we are going to do 11, uh, Revelation 11. Uh, we will start the study uh, in verse 2. Now, why we start in the study in verse 2 when the Bible, the, the translators of the Bible, the Bible was written without um, uh, chapter separations. So, in Revelation, you get a lot of um, chapters that uh, haven't been uh, separated <clears throat> quite correctly. In the sense that now, if you read Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, Actually, Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 belongs to Revelation chapter 10. That should be the last um, verse for Revelation chapter 10. We will find find that out when we study Revelation chapter 10 in, in one of our future studies. But for now, keep that in mind. We are starting in uh, Revelation chapter 2, uh, Revelation um, uh, 11, and we are going to do a verse-by-verse -verse study of Revelation 11 so that we understand it. And there are such a lot of things in Revelation 11 that um, we need to understand for us to understand uh, the fifth trumpet because this is the interlude between that trumpet, right? Okay, so let's read Revelation 11 verse two and we will then start uh, by unpacking each verse. But leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Okay. Now, given means someone is giving the court to them, right? To the Gentiles, and mm -hmm. they will... That is a future tense, right? Tread the city underfoot. That is for 42 months. This is from, remember, John is writing. So it is um, uh, given in the, uh, in, the, in the future tense there, right? Now, for us to understand this, um, this verse clearly, there are a few questions that we need to ask. And I have put them up there. What is the meaning of the court in this verse? What is the, this verse referring to uh, as the court? What is the court? Why does the angel command John not to measure the court of the temple? Now, measure means judge, right? You know, in the Bible, in prophecy, measuring means to judge. So why didn't he say, don't measure the temple? Why did he say, why did he just say, don't measure the court, right? So we're going to answer that question. Then Daniel 8, uh, verses 10 to 13, refers to tram the trampling of the sanctuary. And Revelation 13, 5 speaks of the blasphemy, blaspheming of the temple in heaven. Now, do these actions have anything to do with not measuring the court? Right? Better. Remember, we are talking about verse 2, right? So, in other words, is there any relationship between Daniel 8 and Revelation chapter 11, verse 2? Now, what does the holy city represent in this verse? What does, it, what does it mean? What does it represent? And then who are the Gentiles who trample the holy city? When did the period of the 42 months begin? And when did it end? Are the 42 months past or future? Now, so many, even in our, in our church, these days uh, think that there, it is it was uh, fulfilled in the past, but it also has a future meaning. Uh, but that is not what prophecy tells us. That is not what the Bible says. Us. We will find that out, okay? Did God, God give the court of the temple to the Gentiles before or after the measurement of the temple begins? So those are the questions we are going to um, ask and then we are going to answer. Now, now that we have the questions, let, let's look at the answers to this question. Now, Daniel and Revelation refer to the 1260 days in different ways with different emphasis okay now in revelation in actually um, in actually uh, we are going to find several places where you have the 1260 days mentioned 
Now in Daniel 7, the emphasis falls, when the, this, this time period is spoken of, the emphasis falls upon the papacy, what the papacy did as a system, the papal system on earth during the 1260 day, years, right? Day and year in prophecy, day is a year in prophecy, right? So Daniel 7 is talking about what the system did, the papal system did during this 1260 years. It blasphemed God, it persecuted the saints of God, it thought it could change the times, right? Prophetic times, that's what it thought, and it thought it could change the law of God. So the focus in Daniel 7 is on the actions of the little horn for time, times, and a dividing of times. Now, they all mean the same, right? Time, times, and a dividing of times in Revelation 7.25. Revelation 12.2 says the same thing. Then in Revelation 13.3 says 1,260 days and years. And then you get 42 months. So they're all the same period, but with di different emphasis, emphasis on what's happening, right? Then in Revelation 12, the central focus uh, falls on Satan, who is who is the driving force behind the persecution of the saints by the papacy. The woman has to flee to the wilderness. Remember, we studied that last time because the devil is after her. So the focus there is upon Satan persecuting God's church. Daniel 7 is what the papal system did during the 1260 years. Revelation 12 is the focus is on Satan persecuting the church. Then Revelation 13, where this time period is mentioned again, um, emphasize, uh, the emphasis is different. It seems to fall upon the attack upon the name of God, those who dwell in heaven, the heavenly sanctuary, and the saints of the sanctuary, which is also the emphasis of Daniel 8. So Daniel 8 and uh, Revelation 13, the emphasis is different. The emphasis during this time is the attack on the name of God, it, it, the attacking of those in heaven, the heavenly sanctuary, attack of the heavenly sanctuary, and the um, uh, saints of that sanctuary. However, Revelation 11, which we are going to study today and, and next week, the central focus is upon the attack against the Bible and the word of God. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we have... Daniel 8 is the paper system and on earth during this time period and what they did. Revelation 12 is the focus is on Satan persecuting the church. Revelation 13 is the, the attack. The emphasis is on the attack of the name of God. Uh, those who dwell in heaven, the heavenly sanctuary, the saints of the sanctuary. But Revelation 11, which we are studying today, the attack, the emphasis during this time period is against the Bible and the word of God. Okay, is that clear? So we have these time periods in Revelation 7, uh, Daniel 7, Revelation 12, 13, and in Revelation 11, and the same, the same time period is mentioned uh, in all places, but the emphasis, as we just found out, in each is different. So we are going to um, uh, focus today on Revelation 11, which is the attack on the Bible and the word of God. Okay, now Mrs. My White makes a definite connection between what the papacy did with the Bible during the 1260 years, which was during the fourth trumpet, remember we studied that, and the events of um, the French Revolution, which is the fifth trumpet, right? So the proscription or the prohibition of the Bible by the papacy during the 1260 years led to spiritual ignorance that exploded in the French Revolution and led to the revolutionaries to crucify the two witnesses or the Bible. So you, that's why we had to study the uh, fourth and fifth trumpets together. What the fourth trumpet did, uh, because of what the fourth trumpet did, the fifth trumpet, you get the French Revolution. So let's notice a couple of um, statements by Mrs. White. Uh, let's go to Great Controversy, page 265. The war against the Bible carried forward for so many centuries in France, culminated in the scenes of the revolution. 
a terrible outbreaking was but the legitimate result of Rome's suppression of the scriptures. She's very clear there, right? So mm -hmm. she links the 1260 years with the French Revolution. What happened during the 1250 years only resulted in the French Revolution and the ferocity of what happened. Let's read uh, Great Controversy, page 276. It was popery that had begun the work which atheism was completing. The policy of Rome had wrought out those conditions, social, political, and religious, that were hurrying France on to ruin. Mm. Okay. Mm. So this is why we need to study the fourth and the fifth trumpets together, right? To see that during the fourth trumpet, you had the beginning of the work against the Bible. And then when the French Revolution came, by that time, people had got so fed up of the church that you have the conclusion of that work against the Bible, right? Uh, now, this is an important sequence that we find in Daniel 8 and Revelation 11, 2, which echoes, right? Now, we are going to deal, um, uh, we, will we are first going to deal with Daniel chapter 8. Uh, Daniel chapter 8 tells us, that the little horn, remember, trampled on the um, sanctuary and those who worshipped there and took away the daily. Remember, we did a study. Daily means the work that Jesus is continually doing in the holy place of the sanctuary, right? The, a, a word that describes the work of the priest in the court and in the holy place. Now, both Daniel and Revelation use the specific word trampled as it relates to the sanctuary, okay? The trampling of the sanctuary, the host, and the daily transpires for 42 months, which is the same as the 1260 years or the time, times, and dividing of times, right? And then at the end of the 2,300 days, the process of the cleansing of the sanctuary begins, okay? So thus Daniel describes a clear transition from the daily service found in Daniel chapter 8 verses 10 to 13 to the yearly service, which is the day of atonement, that you find in Daniel chapter 8 verse 14. Now the same is true of Revelation chapter 11 verses 1 and 2. So there is this close parallel between Daniel 8 and Revelation 11. For the 1,600 years, for 1,260 uh, years, God allowed the Gentiles. Now, who are the Gentiles? The Gentiles are equivalent to the little horn of Daniel 7, okay? To trample the city of Jerusalem, as well as upon the truth revealed by the two witnesses. And then after this period, God would begin to measure. Now, measure means to judge, right? The measuring rod, measure in prophecy means to judge, right? And God would begin, the, in the, the, the judgment begins in the most holy place and those who worship there, okay? So thus, there is this close link between Daniel 8 and Revelation uh, chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. And in Daniel 8, the trampling of the prince, after the trampling of the prince, the host, and the sanctuary for 1,260 years, the process to cleanse the sanctuary begins. In Revelation 11, the Gentiles trample upon Jerusalem, those who worship there, and then the temple is measured, right? So cleansing is the same as measuring. Okay, Cleansing and measuring are the same. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Right. Now let's move on to a interesting statement. Uh, by Albert Barnes. Now, he wasn't an Adventist, but he was an old commentator of the Bible. And actually, the old commentators, they concen uh, concentrated on the Bible. They didn't add um, a bunch of psychological or self-helping things, right? They actually deal with the bi biblical text, right? So he almost sounds like an Adventist here. Let's notice what he says. In, his, um, in this uh, quotation that I put up there about the 42 months. This, as we have 
the meaning is that the Roman Catholic community, communion as an organized body is to be regarded as no part of the true church. A conclusion which is inevitable if the passages of scripture which are commonly supposed by Protestants to apply to it are correctly applied. The determine, to determine this and to separate the true church from it was no small part mm -hmm. of the work of the Rome Refor Reformation. Okay, that's where he got it wrong. It was not the Reformation who did that. But what mm -hmm. is he talking about? What does he mean by estimate? What does estimating mean here? He says estimating the true church. Uh, that would be us, um, be, be another word for judging, right? You estimate something, you judge something, right? So if this interpretation is correct, the meaning is that the Roman Catholic commune, communion as an organized body is to be disregarded as part of the true church. Quite an amazing statement, right? Now, this is coming from a Presbyterian uh, Biblical Bible commentator. He says that the separation was done by the Reformation, like I said. That's where he goes off track a little bit. Um, where is the separation done? It is after the 1260 years. Now, you and I know that if we, because we have studied it. After the 1260 years, and it is done in the heavenly sanctuary, right? In the investigative judgment, we started in 1844. So the Reformation is doesn't is not the one that estimated. It is the judgment that began in 1844. But he's pretty much on target in what he wrote. So, you know, for uh, I mean, for any of us to believe that a Protestant would write such a statement today uh, is not possible because today we are living in different times and we're living in so-called polit politically correct times, right? Now, this was a Protestant commentator. Now, going back to our comments on Revelation, once again, Revelation 11, 1, the angel in Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, the angel transported John in vision to 1844 and told him to measure the temple and those who worship there. Measure once again is judge, right? Remember judge. This is the verse that belongs to uh, chapter 10 and not chapter 11. We will, when we study chapter 10, you will understand why that, that, that actually belongs to 10, right? However, the angel also told him not to measure the court where the Gentiles worship because it was given to the Gentiles. Now, listen carefully. It is not will be given to them from 1844 forward. But rather, it was given to them from mm -hmm. 538 AD forward, right? So don't get that wrong. 1844 is when the estimation of the of the measurement that the angel gives John begins to happen. But before that, the Gentiles trample the uh, court court, and the Gentiles were given to were given to trample the court from AD 538 to AD 1798, right? So that is before the measuring began, okay? Is that clear? Okay, I had a very feeble hmm there. Uh, <laughs> let's go to Revelation uh, 12, uh, 11, now we are in 11, right? Let's go to verses um, 2 and 3. Now, uh, here we find, um, we're going to go a little bit into the grammar. The best translation of the Greek word andothe, which is the which is in passive indicative, is was given. Someone else is giving this power to do this, right? So it, passive means, now active means I am doing something. That is, I'm actively, I am doing but passive is someone else is doing it. It'll be done, right? So that is what passive means in, in, in grammar. And now, so it's, it's worthy to note that in every other appearance of this word, that's endoth and duthe in Greek, in the, new, uh, in, the, in the new international version of the Bible, uh, it's translated as was given. 
only in this instance does the new international version translate it in the perfect tense as having been given, as been given. Now, this is important, so listen carefully. The tense of the verb clearly indicates that God gave the court to the Gentiles before the process of measuring the temple began. Okay, So God gave the court to the Gentiles to tremble before the measuring began. Stated another way, God gave the court to the, the Gentiles. They would trample the holy city for 42 months. And then after the 42 months, the angel told John to measure the temple and its worshippers. Okay? So that is why we need to understand that once again, Revelation chapter 11 verse 1 belongs to chapter 10. And it is the conclusion of chapter 10. Right? So you can go into your Bible and check that out so you can understand that a little better. Now, the Bible quotation that I put up there on, on the slide is taken from Young's literal translation of Revelation 11, 2, and 3. Now, this captures, this translation captures this um, word endothe correctly, right? So, let's read that and see. And the code that is without the sanctuary leave out. And thou mayest not measure it, because it was given to the nations and the holy city. They shall tread down 42 months, and I will give to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy day, prophecy days, a 1,260 arrayed with settler. Okay, so now that is a clearer translation. So God says... Um, don't begin the measuring, right? Don't begin the measuring. It was given, it has been given to the Gentiles. The court has been given to the Gentiles and they shall, they shall now, remember this is from uh, John's time. They shall tread down 42 months and then I will give my two witnesses. They are going to find out exactly the two witnesses. Right now we know it's scripture, but it's going to open up and you're going to see something more. Um, amazing about the two witnesses and then they shall that's a future tense prophesy 1260 years in sackcloth so the the two witnesses will prophesy during this 1260 years which is given to the gentiles to trample in sackcloth right so when was the court given to the gentiles once again in 83 uh, 80 uh, 538 AD they trample the holy city for 42 months, same time period as 1,260 years. And then after that, the temple will be measured. So the court was given to the Gentiles is in the past, the measuring of the temple takes place only after they trample. Now there is a chart that I'm going to put up here uh, that will help us to understand this a little bit more clearly, right? Now on the left-hand side, here you get, um, you have the court, right? And John is told not to measure the court because it was given in the year 538 AD to the Gentiles. Now, in this case, as Albert Barnes said, uh, to the Roman Catholic Church for this period of dominion, right? So that was the uh, 1260 years of papal dominion. Then we come to the center. Then for 42 months, the Gentiles are going to trample upon Jerusalem, right? So from this point, from the point of the court, trampling is future, okay? Is a future tense. And then in 1798, that would, what would happen to the little horn? It would lose its power, the control he had on the civil powers of uh, Europe. Right, So he use, uh, loses his civil power. And then in 1844, the process to measure the temple for, would begin. So the court was in 538. Then up to from 538 AD to 1798, the, um, the little horn tramples upon Jerusalem or the holy city. And then in 1798, it loses his power. 
Then in 1844, God tells the, the John when he's writing, then the, the measuring of the temple will begin. Okay, that's clear, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, in the New Testament, now this is very in, important, listen very carefully. In the New Testament, the temple and Jerusalem represent God's faithful people on the earth. So when you hear Jerusalem or you hear the temple, it's referring to the faithful people of God. Now I put up there a series of passages that prove this point. We are not going to read all those. We don't have time. But if you like, you can take a snapshot of that and read those verses for yourself when you have time. Uh, because in these verses, it clearly tells us that Jerusalem and the temple are referring to God's faithful people during the uh, New Testament time. Now, once again, going back to Albert Barnes, the commentator for the Bible, uh, let's read what he has to uh, say about Revelation 11 verse 2. The holy city, Jerusalem, was regarded as sacred to God as his dwelling place on earth and as the, uh, as the abode of his people and nothing was more natural than to use the term as representing the church. Okay, so he that's his commentary. And if you read those passages that are given up there, the Bible is very clear. Jerusalem and the temple refer to God's faithful people. So this statement is um, has significant implication because if the holy city and the temple um, here represent the church, then in Revelation 14, 20, the city that the wicked surround, when we study that, when we go further and we study Revelation 14, 20, the, um, uh, we may have read those texts before, the city that the wicked surround then they say the city, the holy city, the wicked surround, then must represent the church or the faithful of God on this earth, right? Remember the horses that trample the wine press. We did that when we were doing one of our other studies outside the holy city. That would represent the church, which means that the wicked are going to try to destroy God's people and Jesus with the horses of heaven, with his armies of heaven, is going to come to trample the wine press to deliver his people, right? And then the scenario looks like this, okay? So during the 1,260 years, God allows the Gentiles to trample upon the holy city or temple, right? But in Revelation 14, 20 and Revelation 19, 14 uh, and 15, the Lord will trample upon the Gentiles or nations, that is according to Joel 3, who will gather around the end time church with the specific intention of destroying it, right? Now this provides evidence that God will trample upon those who trample upon his people, who trampled upon his people during the 1,260 years. This helps explain how end time Babylon will receive double of what she gave. Now that is found in Revelation 18 verse six. She trampled about God's people and God in, in turn will trample upon her, okay? <laughs> now, going further. Now, we're still discussing Revelation uh, 11, 2. Now, in, uh, the Gentiles stand in contrast to the holy city in the same manner as found in Daniel 7. The saints are in contrast to the little horn. And in Revelation 13, the saints are in con contrast to the beast. Now, when the Bible speaks about Jerusalem being overwhelmed by the beast, it's not talking about brick, brick and mortar, right? But rather the people in the city. Now, let's pursue this thought a little further. Daniel 1, 1 and 2 tells us that Nebuchadnezzar took Jerusalem captive. Now, he didn't take physical Jerusalem, Babylon, right? He, he didn't take the physical city of Jerusalem to Babylon, but rather he took the citizens of the city, right? The trampling of the city by the Gentiles for 42 months is the same thing. It's the same thing as persecuting 
of the saints that we find in Daniel 7 and Revelation 12 and 30. So trampling and persecuting are the same. And uh, the court in, uh, in uh, chapter 11 and the uh, people, that is the city, Jerusalem, the city, God's faithful people, are the same. This is a different way that the Bible refers to these things, right? So the Gentiles are those who are not true Jews, right? Are true believers, but rather counterfeit Jews uh, who, uh, counterfeit Jews. Now, who is a, who is a true Jew and who, uh, and who is a counterfeit? A true Jew, by the way, is if you are, if you are Christ, you are Adam's seed, right? Galatians 3 tells us that. Uh, you are Adam's seed, and it is not the children of faith that are the true children of God, but the children who have the Holy Spirit, right? Who are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We studied that last week, I think. Who is a counterfeit Jew? A counterfeit Jew is an individual who claims to be a follower of Christ, but is a counterfeit follower, fake follower of Christ. The gent so they call themselves Christians, but they don't follow uh, the principles that God has laid down in the Bible. The Gentiles are those who are not true Jews or true believers, but rather counterfeit Jews or counterfeit believers, right? So the Gentiles referred to there are the counterfeits. These counterfeit believers are not judged in 1844, okay? Mm -hmm. These counterfeit believers, though they call, call themselves Christians, are not judged in 1844, in 1844 onwards, now the judgment is on, uh, those who, who are being judged are only the righteous. Now in Daniel chapter 7 and 8, the central <laughs> focus of the judgment is not on the co condemnation of the little horn. That is not what the um, uh, uh, Daniel 7 and 8 are focusing on, but rather are on rewarding the saints who receive the kingdom, right? So Daniel 7 and 8 is focusing on rewarding the saints. So they are the uh, true believers. Those uh, judged beginning 1844 are those who profess Christ. That's for sure, right? But why are you having a judgment? Because you are, you have the fake, the wheat and the tares. You have the good fish and the bad fish, right? So you have the genuine and the fake. But the purpose of the judgment is to separate the fake from the true. Right, remove the counterfeit, put them onto a side, and judge the truth. So, by the way, the counterfeit believers are not judged at that. Why, right? when they are being weeded out in the in the judgment process, they are not judged at that point. Right, Mrs. White says um, that if there is a person who claimed to be uh, to believe in Christ, but his records, his books show that they were not true believers, their case is put aside to be dealt with during the millennium, right? So when, mm -hmm. when, when the, uh, as the judgment is going on, you find a, uh, a fake, a counterfeit, their cases are put aside to be judged in the, uh, during the thousand years, the millennium. And if there is a, a, a case that is found that there's a true believer, they mm -hmm. are the ones who will be Judge. So the purpose of the judgment that began in 1844 is for Christ to reveal who the members, who the subjects of his kingdom are, because when he comes, he's going to take his kingdom with him, right? So for him to take his kingdom with him, he has to know who the subjects are. So that is why the true believers are the ones who will be judged. Is that clear? Mm. Okay, I, have, I heard a very feeble mm, there. Now, in the judgment before the second coming, God will pronounce a sentence in favor of the saints of the Most High. Now, during and after the millennium, God will announce a verdict against the wicked oppressors. By during the millennium, when the wicked are judged, we will also be part of the judging, presuming that we will be saved, mm -hmm. right? I hope all of us are saved. Then... <laughs> God will announce a verdict and he will carry out his verdict when he comes now, right? Now, it is not coincidence that the sixth church, Philadelphia, as in Revelation 11, 1, there are people who say that they are Jews, but they are not. Now, by the way, the church of Philadelphia, God has placed an open door there, right? 
the open door, where did it, where does it lead? It leads into the most holy place, right? That's the synagogue of Satan in the church of Philadelphia. And the Gentiles under the sixth trumpet are closely related. Remember, you get the, you got the synagogue of Satan and the Gentiles under the sixth trumpet. So, you know, that is why, you know, when you study the seals and the churches together, you understand them better, right? So they, 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 are, they are closely related. Notice to paraphrase versions, right? Now we need to be very careful. Paraphrases are not uh, actually recommended, but these two paraphrase uh, versions of uh, Revelation 11, 2, Catch the correct nuance of the verse. So let's read. The first one is from the New Century Version. Let's read that. And the next one is from the Messenger. So let's read the New Century Version. The court has been given to those who are not God's people. Okay, so they got that correct, right? Let's read the message. It it has the court uh, ha, a court being handed over to non-Jewish outsiders. Okay, so they have got that correct, right? The court is not the genuine believers. The court is the counterfeit, right? So let's read a, a, another statement by Albert Barnes, this um, Barnes. Presbyterian minister uh, who. Um, who was a commentator on the Bible, right? Let's read that. And his statements are a lot. I hope Albert Barnes became an Adventist. I don't know. <laughs> but it's the, his, um, his views are very much like a, the Adventists. Let's read what he has to say. This would find a ful fulfillment if there should arise a state of things in the church in which it would be necessary to draw a line between those who properly constituted the church and those who did not. If there should be such a condition of things that any considerable portion of those who professedly pertained to the church out ought to be divided off as not belonging to it or would have such characteristics marks that it could be seen that they were strangers and aliens. The interpretation would demand that they should sustain some relation to the church or that they would seem to belong to it, as the court did to the temple, but still that this was in appearance only and that in estimating the true church, it was necessary to leave them out altogether. Hmm. So he gets it very clearly, right? So he's, he, he's talking about the judgment, separating people who are in the church, those who are believers from those who are counterfeit believers, right? So it's critical that we understand this point for when we are going to deal with Revelation chapter 10, okay? Because in chapter, because Revelation chapter 10 is talking about the announcement of the beginning of the investigative judgment in 1844. That's why we skip 10 first and we are studying 11 before that so that we can understand 10 better. Now, as, as I said, all of our comments so far have been on verse 2 of Revelation 11. So let's go to verse 3. And what's going to happen here is that it's, that we find that it's going to go back and talk about the Gentiles during the 1,260 years. Now, not the future uh, measuring of the oh, measuring, but going back to the 1,260 years. Huh? It has been introduced not to measure the court because it was given to the Gentiles. And now we are going to have a description of what the Gentiles did from 538 AD to 1798. What did they do? Now we're going to understand that. Now in verse um, 2, um, John introduces the Gentiles, which represents the counterfeit believers, like we just discussed, in the church. And so the angel says, don't measure them, because your purpose is to determine who is the member 
who can be actual members, true members of Christ's kingdom, right? Because when he comes, he wants to take his kingdom, his people home. And then he says, now I'm going to go back and I'm going to talk about the period when the Gentiles trample the holy city. So let's read verse 3. And I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Okay. Now, like we asked the questions in verse 2, let's ask a couple of questions here in verse 3 as well. Who are the two witnesses? Okay. Why are they clothed in sackcloth? Who mm -hmm. is the person that gives them power to prophesy? That is to say, who is saying, I will give power to my witnesses, to my two witnesses? Why do two olive trees and two candlesticks symbolize the two witnesses? So those are the questions we are going to answer. The first one is, who are the two witnesses? Right? The person who gives the two witnesses power to prophesy is Jesus. Right? Because he sent the power of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost to enable the apostles to be his witnesses, to proclaim the word. Word. Let's read Acts 1 verse 8 so that we are clear. Who gives power to the witnesses, to the two witnesses to prophesy is Jesus. Let's read Acts 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Okay. So clearly we must link the two witnesses to Acts chapter 1 where Jesus promised to impart power to his apostles and refer to them with the possessive pronoun, my, right? My witnesses, right? And called upon them to be his witnesses to the world. Now, although the word power is not in the original verse of verse, uh, original in verse three, most versions say that Jesus gave the two witnesses power or authority to witness in his name, right? Someone may wonder whether the two witnesses represent the Old and the New Testament. We know that they do. But there is more to this story. I don't know whether you have ever realized it, but there is more when Jesus is giving power to my two witnesses to this story. Now in, the, in, the, in Acts, we are told he gave his disciples, the Holy Spirit, and told them to be his witnesses, right? Now, Jesus made the apostles the depositories of the oracles of God, right? He called them to preach his message as found in the Old and the New Testaments, right? So thus, the two witnesses symbolize, listen carefully, God's messengers who have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to give the message of salvation to the world as found in the Old and the New Testament, right? So it's not either the Old or the New Testament and the preachers, but it's both. The, the preachers, the one who share what is found in the New and Old Testament are God's witnesses. Is that clear? Now, Ellen White mm -hmm. underlines that the two witnesses impart their message to the world through the medium of the church, right? So that's the two, rep two witnesses represent the Bible, but as the Bible is preached by the faithful in the church. Now, the Bible is a book, but if it isn't preached, if it isn't lived, if it isn't shared, then how can it witness? Have you ever thought about it like that? Let's read uh, uh, Testimonies, Volume 4, pages 594 and 595. Until Christ shall appear in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, men will become perverse in spirit and turn from truth to fables. The church will yet see trouble troublous times. She will prophesy in sackcloth, although she must meet heresies and persecutions. Although she must battle with the infidel and the apostate, yet by the help of God she is bruising the head of Satan. The Lord will have a people as true as steel and with faith as firm as the granite rock. 
they uh, they are to be his witnesses and in the world um, his instrumentality is to do a special a glorious work in the day of his preparation mm, is that clear now for most of the time we think that when they, the two witnesses are the bible but the word of god is a book it does no good he god has to have a people that study the bible they study this book they preach the book they witness the book they live the book so they, so the two witnesses if you please are the bible but god's faithful people who share the bible right so the old and the new testament have to be studied by his people empowered by the holy spirit and shared witness uh to what is given in the bible is that clear no okay now although there are two witnesses that is the old and the new they act as one right in perfect unison they testify together they pour out plagues together they suffer persecution together the beast from the bottomless pit kills them together and they resurrect and ascend to heaven together thus although there are two witnesses they are in perfect harmony and act as one right so they there are two but they act as one revelation 11:8 uses the singular word body to a collective sense of both witnesses their dead body then in verse 9 the word body appears once more in the singular the plural will be bodies but it's referred to as body before the greek switches to the plural the same thing happens in verse 5 with reference to the word mouth which is singular though um, thus although the witnesses are two in number they speak as one <laughs> the text refers to them as one they are one because they have a common purpose to reveal the one and only jesus so you if you take the bible the old and the new testament they are in perfect harmony right they are in perfect harmony the old and the new testament are in perfect harmony right then there were two prophets they known as the two prophets the two the witnesses received power to prophesy right so the old and the new testament received power to prophesy so they must be they must have the prophetic gift let's read first peter 1 verses 10 to 12 and i put it there in the new international version because it's clearer to understand concerning this salvation the old testament prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of christ in them was pointing in the old testament when when he predicted testified beforehand the sufferings of christ and the glories that would follow follow it was revealed to them the old testament prophets that they were not serving themselves but you those who lived in the new testament when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the holy spirit sent from heaven even angels long to look into these things okay so the witnesses the two witnesses as a uh, prophets point into Jesus the entire bible the thread that runs through the bible is Jesus right the old testament prophets and the new testament prophets all point to Christ okay they they are two but they act as one now there is this um um the two witnesses are not just ordinary prophets the context clearly reveals that the two prophets function in the power and the spirit of moses and elijah okay so listen carefully this is made clear by the fact that moses brought a judgment of god upon egypt for rejecting god's word 
by turning the waters of the Nile into blood. Okay, that's found. And in Revelation 11, as we, as we have found out, the waters are symbolic of people, right? Now, Elijah brought a judgment of fire down from heaven for the same reason upon the people, right? Now, do, does this mean that Moses and Elijah would appear literally and personally during the 1260 years? No, not more than Jezebel. Would she, did she appear in the fourth church or Balaam in the third, third church? No, they didn't appear literally during the period of the seven churches. We are dealing here with symbols, right? So Moses and Elijah are symbolic in this passage, right? Moses was the prophet that began the history of Israel. And uh, thus being the giant spokesperson of the old dispensation or the Old Testament, right? If you want to find that out, it's found in John 5, verses 45 to 47. Now, on the other hand, Elijah was the prophet of the future. John the Baptist and the entire Elijah movement. John was the last prophet of the old dispensation and announced the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy in Jesus. Now, the Gospels identify John the Baptist as Elijah, okay, who bore witness to Jesus, who is the light, right? Jesus is the greatest light. Now, the last book of the Old Testament brings to view both Moses and Elijah. Moses is presented as the prophet of the past, and Elijah is the prophet of the future. Elijah, not in person. It is an Elijah movement, the remnant church, that will preach the same message that Elijah preached. Thus, they represent the Old and the New Testaments. Thus, they are witnesses. Now, what was the Elijah message? Elijah was calling people back to true worship, calling mm -hmm. people back to the true Bible, calling people back from apostasy to worship God. Anyway, let's read Malachi 4. Verses four to six. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. With the statutes and judgments, behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Okay. So the Elijah message is repentance, calling people back to true worship, right? Calling people back to the true sanctuary message, calling people back today, calling people back to the three angels message. That is the Elijah message. So the two prophets, Elijah and Moses, the theme is uh, Moses was the old, uh, the prophet of the Old Testament of the past, but Elijah is the prophet of the future. So new and old, the two testaments, the two witnesses, right? Now the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Remember they had that in verse three. So this adds further in information to what we have been discussing. Revelation 1, 2 further collaborates that the two witnesses represent the Old and the New Testament. This verse tells us that John bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. In fact, John was on Patmos for bearing witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. The martyrs, the word martyrs means witness, right? Witnesses of the dark ages and the end time suffered and will suffer uh, death because of their faithfulness in proclaiming the word of God and the testimony of Jesus that is found in Revelation 2, uh, 24. Hebrews 1, 1 states that God spoke in all times by the prophets, but in these last days has spoken by his son. That's the Old Testament and the New Testament. Old Testament is by the prophets. New Testament is by the Son. Jesus stated that there were two witnesses to his divine calling, the Father and himself, right? Now, we are not going to the verses because we don't have time. 
Now let's read a quotation from uh, Kenneth Stan. Uh, Strand, he was a um, teacher in Andrews University. He was seminary then. And let's read what he uh, wrote, his commentary on the two witnesses of Revelation 3 to 12. These two witnesses are namely the word of God and the testimony of Christ Jesus, or what we today would call the OT prophetic message and the NT apostolic witness. The two okay. witnesses of Revelation. Okay, OT means Old Testament prophetic message and the New Testament mm -hmm. apostolic witness. Okay, now the Bible describes God's spiritual message in terms mm -hmm. of two sums. The Bible is one book, a unity composed of two parts. Okay, the Bible is a two-edged sword. Two witnesses, two candlesticks, two olive trees, two keys. Okay. Jesus said to Peter, I will give you the keys without a qualifier, the dual. I will give you the keys. Then we have Moses and Elijah, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So if the Bible is a twosome. It's a, a two in one, right? As, you, as we would call it. It is clear that the two witnesses are the Bible, but one because they give witness to Jesus. Now, Mrs. White, in great controversy, made this statement. So she's, she explicitly explains uh, to us, the two witnesses, that the two witnesses are the Old and the New Testament. Let's read that. Great Controversy, page 267. The two witnesses represent the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament. Both are important testimonies to the origin and propriety of the law of God. Both are witnesses also to the plan of salvation. The types, sacrifices, the prophecies of the Old Testament point forward to a savior to come. The gospels and epistles of the New Testament tell of a savior who has come in the exact manner foretold by type and prophecy. Okay, so the Old Testament is symbols and types. The New Testament is the reality. Jesus actually came, right? So the Old Testament and New Testament are two distinctive testaments, but they, they bear witness to one person and that is Jesus. So although they, they are two, they give witness to one. The Old Testament give it, gives witness to Jesus, and so does the New. In fact, the reason why John wrote the gospel, his gospel, was to give witness to Jesus, right? John 21, verses 24 and 25 tell us that. Now, moving on. Now, we are told that the Old Testament and the New Testament, the two witnesses, they prophesied during this 1,200 uh, 60 years or the 42 months, the period we are talking about, uh, the paper, the dominion, the period of papal dominion in which the fourth trumpet is, um, uh, right? And the scripture, in the, the in scripture, God's, they, they, they prophesy in sackcloth, obscurity and persecution. Now in scripture, let's, we are going to find out what sackcloth means. In scripture, God's people use sackcloth when the wicked persecute them, okay? So sackcloth also represents the darkness of error and persecution and affliction, right? Now, when king, the king of Assyria uh, came with the intention of destroying Jerusalem, King Hezekiah wore sackcloth. Let's read that in 2 Kings 19, 1 to 3. So remember, sackcloth represents when the wicked persecute God's people, right? Let's read that. And so it was when King Hezekiah heard it, that he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. Then he sent Eliakim, who was over the household of Shibna, the scribe, and the elders of the priest covered with slack sackcloth to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said to him, Thus says, says Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy, for the children have come to birth, 
but there's no strength to bring them forth. Okay, so here we find uh, King Hezekiah, he tore his clothes, he covered himself in sackcloth. Why? Because he was going to suffer persecution, right? Mm -hmm. And there was going to be a time of crisis. There was going to be a time of trouble for Jerusalem. Then Esther 4, uh, 1 to 4, once again, we find here when Mordecai learns about what's going to happen to him. But let's, let's read that as well. Mm -hmm. When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, where the king's command and degree arrived, there was great mourning and among the Jews with fasting, weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Okay, so once again, we find they clothe themselves in sackcloth. Why? Because they are going to be persecuted. So that is why the two witnesses during the 1260 years are referred to as being clothed in sackcloth, right? So how did the witnesses testify during the 42 months? They are prophesying in distress, in pain, in anguish, because they are being persecuted. So now we understand the sackcloth, obscurity, and persecution. Then Isaiah 53 says, Clothe the heavens in blackness, and I make sackcloth of their coverings. That's, this is again a synonymous parallelism about blackness and Sackcloth. So when there's persecution, there's trouble for God's people, there is blackness, and then they wear uh, sackcloth. Let's read Revelation 6, 12. This is during the sixth seal. It says that I looked upon, uh, looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. So the sixth seal is talking about uh, the this time of um, great distress and persecution for God's people. Then moving on, Mrs. White explained the meaning of sackcloth. Let's read uh, Christ Object Lessons, page 414 and 415. Not only is Satan leading the world captive, uh, but his deceptions are leaving the prophet churches of our Lord Jesus Christ. The great apostasy will develop into darkness Deep as midnight, impenetrable as sackcloth of hair. To God's people, it will be a night of trial, a night of weeping, a night of persecution for the truth's sake. However, out of that night of darkness, God's light will shine. Praise wow. the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes, beautiful. Let's read Publishing Ministries, page 2, uh, 324. The great apostasy is working to a point and will develop into darkness, deep as midnight, impenetrable as sackcloth of hair. This is the time to employ any system that can, de that can be devised to discover and counteract the leap of error. Let there be light. There should be 100 light bearers in our world where there is one today. Darkness will become more dense in human minds after the truth has been treated and uh, been rejected. However, there are some minds where the darkness will be removed. They recognize the light. Okay. So here mm -hmm. Mrs. White saw a deeper dimension to the two witnesses than just the Old and the New Testament, right? She discerns that they represent the church that preaches from these two testaments, okay? And as a result, the proclaimers suffer persecution. So in other words, the two, two witnesses testify through the medium of the Holy Spirit who empowers the church and the result is persecution like we, we, we saw during those dark ages. This is precisely what the introduction to the book of Re Revelation affirms. The Roman Empire exiled John to Patmos for the word of God 
and the testimony of Jesus. That is the prophetic message in the Bible. God gave the book of Revelation uh, to Jesus. Jesus gave the book of Revelation to the spirit, the spirit to the angel, the angel to John, John to the churches, and the churches are supposed to give it to the world, right? The seven candlesticks represent the work of the church in imparting this light of truth found in the two witnesses. So, so the deeper dimension is the Bible studied by the true, um, true followers of Christ and given to the world, shine, shared with the world and witness to the world. That is what the two witnesses represent. Let's read, uh, once again, Publishing Ministries, page 386, and then we'll read Gate Controversy 2, uh, 86 on this same subject a little further. Until Christ shall appear in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, men will become perverse in spirit and turn from the truth to fables. The church will yet see trou trou troublous times. She will prophesy in sackcloth. But although she must meet heresies and persecutions, although she must battle with the infidel and the apostate, yet by the help of God, she is bruising the head of Satan. Okay. The next one, just a second, Esther. Hold on a little. There's someone at the door. Just a moment. Yes. Okay, sorry, Esther, go ahead. Hello. God's witnesses okay. remained in a state of obscurity. The papal power sought to hide from the people the word of truth and set before them false witnesses to contradict its testimony. When the Bible was proscribed by religious and secular authority, when its testimony was perverted, and every effort made that men and demons would invent to turn the minds of the people from it when those who dared proclaim its sacred truths were hunted, betrayed, tortured, buried in dungeon cells, martyred for their faith, or compelled to flee to mountain fastness and to dens and caves of the earth. Then the faithful witnesses prophesied in cloth, in sackcloth. Mm. Okay, so that explains to us how um, uh, the, the, the two witnesses prophesy and how sackcloth uh, represents not just the Old and the New Testament, but the Old and the New Testament uh, given by uh, the faithful people. Okay, then let's talk about the 42 months and the 1260 days. Um, let's read from Great Controversy 266. The periods here mentioned, Revelation 11, 2 to 42, 40 and 2 months. And verse 3, 1,203 score days are the same, alike representing the time in which the Church of Christ was to suffer oppression from Rome. The 1,260 years of papal supremacy began in AD 538 and would therefore terminate in 1798. At that time, a French army entered Rome and made the Pope a prisoner and he died in exile. Though a new Pope was soon afterwards elected, the papal hierarchy has never since been able to weld the power which is before process. Okay, so Mrs. White here is explicit that these periods of Revelation 11 
two and three represent the 1260 years of the past paper domain past dominion of the papacy past right for us it's past she clear she's clear about that she never applies them to the future so this for 42 months the 1260 years is past it finished right it's not in the future now why is that because there are many with the um who who have this thought that though it was fulfilled in the past that it will be also fulfilled in the future which is not biblical and which is not correct mrs white said we are not supposed to set time for prophetic events the last event that is marked in the bible by time is october 22 1844 in revelation chapter 10 also it says time will be no longer okay and that's not talking about the end of the world it's talking about the close of probation okay when Revelation says time will be no longer, it's referring to the prophecies of the 1,200 and, uh, uh, sorry, the 2,300 day prophecy, right? Or 2,300 year. That is the last time prophecy. And there are no more, no more prophecies that specify specific time for prophetic events. So if somebody comes trying to show you that you have a date for the close of probation and a date for the Sunday laws and a date for the international wide Sunday law and so on, flee from them because they are not speaking in the name of the Lord. They're speaking from their own hearts and it's very dangerous because it gives a bad witness to the world. So we cannot tell when these are coming, though we have studied from our many lessons and we know that there'll be certain triggers that will uh, indicate to us that these times are there but apart from that we do not know when the time of the end is going to 